this. presented by our special guest, Liva Watteau, um, and the title of Liva's talk is Photometric Stereo Imaging with the Microdome for Studying Book Bindings, Illuminations, Drawings, and Documentary Heritage. But before I turn the microphone over to her, I want to just point out that this is the third in our series of four. Our, our fourth and final lecture will be on November 17th. It will start earlier at 3 p.m. because it will include two documentary film um, films as well as a lecture all devoted to the memory of the Florence Flood. It's the 50th anniversary of the Florence Flood and um, there are lots of tributes going on. It's actually today is the day of the 50th anniversary. And we there, there were so many extraordinary efforts made for cultural uh, a salvation on that day. I mean, we literally saved the, the sort of heritage of Florence 50 years ago. And we will have as a guest a speaker who will talk about uh, recovery efforts at the National Library in Florence, specifically book and paper based documents that essentially changed our field. So do come on November 17th. I think that will be um, exceptional. But turning, keep telling you the reason why we're having this lecture series, some of you have already heard this, is because UCLA is currently exploring um, a graduate uh, education in book and paper conservation as a kind of a cognate field to our already very highly esteemed information studies education that we provide. So we want to produce students who will be the first, um, first university in the country now to be producing students with these dual areas of specialization, information and conservation. We were honored to be selected for one of two national um, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation planning grants. Um, we have a lot to thank the Mellon Foundation for, for the opportunities to have this lecture series. Um, and we're hoping that we can partner with the Mellon Foundation moving forward to create a sustainable program. So please stay tuned. There will be a lot happening um, in, that, uh, in that vein. Um, we, um, we were also thinking all about our cultural partners here in Los Angeles and the, the sort of wealth of opportunity this provides. Essentially, float the book, I mean, really, is what we're, what we're thinking about. So I also, now I want to say a few words about our esteemed guest speaker, Liva Watteau. Um, Liva a study, she studied conservation, actually she told me this just a short while ago. She studied conservation actually many years ago in her early days, but then turned to art history, studying art history at the Catholic University in Leuven. Leuven? Leuven? Okay. <laughs> Um, in Belgium, where she's currently the head of the Books Heritage Lab. Um, Liva is a, so she's a conservator restorator, which is the European designation of books, manuscripts, and library materials. Her academic research focuses on medieval manuscript illumination, book production, technical art history, um, technical art historical research, and conservation and preservation strategies for heritage libraries. Um, uh, the topic of her PhD dissertation research was a historiography of the restoration of Flemish manuscripts. Since 2013, Liva has been working collaboratively, actually extraordinarily collaboratively, when I sort of realized the extent of her reach across her campus, it's, it's quite marvelous. Um, she's been working collaboratively with an imaging lab and the Department of Electrical Engineering, 
Catholic University to develop what's known as the RICH Project, which stands for Reflectance Imaging for Cultural Heritage. So with that, I'm going to welcome Liva to up here. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to come to Los Angeles for CLA to give you this lecture here in the late afternoon. Thank you also to talk about the latest development in research on material characteristics of manuscripts and book heritage produced in medieval and early modern times. When I started as a book conservator some 28 years ago, my Nikon reflex camera was a dear friend and the roles of Kodak negative film be consumed in the conservation lab were so numerous as documentation was implemented from the 80s on of the last century as an essential part of the conservation restoration protocol of books, archives and uh, graphic materials. We documented and explored through macro lenses, we, but really a book was taken to the analytical lab in a time where X-rays and infrared reflectographies were very common for paintings and sculptures. As you all know, the digital camera changed our lives profoundly uh, around 2000. And our shelves with heavy dossiers, files were, were replaced by floppy disks, DVDs, memory sticks, to servers and to clouds as nowadays. We know that the digital camera opened the world of exploration and detailed observations. Scientific imaging is a real blessing for our professional discipline, working with this flexible, fragile, and very light sensitive materials as, as graphic documents are manuscripts, drawings, prints, records, notes, fragile 3D material. We as conservators, but also as art historians, we want to rely on clear observations with the naked eye, or under a binocular, or with more recent options as multispectral imaging and photometric stereo. <coughs> These computerized images create a third knowledge platform, as they are not only observations, not photographic representations, but, are, but as filters and software are merged and manipulated, the recorded item, they reveal information not visible with the human eye and in natural light. Digitally processing and combining the image can reveal important material information recorded through photographic means. These data, these files, are extremely useful for the diagnosis and documentation of the material features of an artifact, of a book, of a manuscript, of a document. And we are looking to them in these labs. It can help us to glean a considerable amount of information on the materiality of our documentary cultural heritage, allowing us to see what would otherwise be invisible for us. This information can prove valuable to scholars and to conservators and their understanding of the object without interfering to their integrity. That's also very important. Communicating this information with the community of scholars, other conservators and the general public is a challenging possibility opening, opening up in these days. One of these imaging tools is the portable light tool, and I'm going to talk about the results you can obtain with the portable light tool today. It's a new imaging tool for researching artifacts, in particular objects we find in museums, libraries, print rooms, and archives. The research I present today is developed at the University of Leuven, and here we see an image of uh, the Central Library of Leuven. The university is founded in 1425, almost 600 years ago, but has a very turbulent uh, history, being bombed uh, two times in the First and Second World War uh, and being two times uh, reconstructed. In the Faculty of Arts, we started a project 
reflecting imaging for cultural heritage in 2012, developing an imaging tool for fragile book heritage. A project on the Bible of Anjou, a great 14th century illuminated manuscript kept in the Faculty of Theology of the University was an accelerator of this approach. The combination of a kind of professional curiosity combined with new developments in the Department of Engineering, Electroengineering at our University, made possible, uh, uh, made approaches in detailed observations possible. After some experiments and very long discussions between conservators, photographers, software developers and engineers, we received in 2012 a grant from Implementing Infrastructure Enabling Research on an interdisciplinary platform. The aim was to develop a new tool to explore and document materiality of documentary heritage on the level of an art technical source. The original tool was developed already in 2008 for the digitalization of the recording of cuneiforms old Assyrian writing tablets, researched on in the archaeology department of Cameleuven. In 2012, the RICH project was launched with tests with a new prototype focusing uh, on documentary documents and with a strong orientation to develop a new design adapted for manuscripts. And as we know, manuscripts are very fragile, sensitive, flexible 3D objects. In 2014, a new microdome construction with white light was finalized using a solid 3D print, and that's what you're seeing here. It is a 3D print, um, and the software and the software measurement tool was uh, implemented. This kind of images we can obtain, and you see here a capture of a book binding uh, from the Getty, uh, from Paul Getty Museum, we took earlier this year. It's from uh, early uh, middle 15th century. <coughs> and with the filters we adapt, we can make very small topographical features visible. Making designs. But what is the difference between polytexture mapping, reflection, transformation imaging, and photometric stereo, the last, the method we are using in Kaiu RTE is known as a technique to image and interactively display surfaces under varying lighting conditions to reveal surface phenomena by imaging and observing that object under different lighting conditions. Photometric stereo, on the contrary, is a technique to image and estimate the surface normals of an object by imaging and observing that object under different lighting conditions. PTM tries to fit a curve or a polynomial texture map through the observations. Then, roughly speaking, it takes a maximum response or average as a surface orientation. Photometric stereo tries to find the different reflection components. For the case to the right, it determines both diffuse and specular components. The technique is based on the fact that the amount of light reflected by a surface depends on the orientation of the surface in relation to the viewpoint of the camera and the position of the light source. The strong points in photometric stereo are the more accurate surface normals where physical laws are properly evaluated. Virtual re-visualization re is possible using simultaneous and physical laws. It can also return additional color characteristics such as a color, a natural material color, specular color, or ambient color. Additional forms of visualization and thus possibilities to analyze on the point of view of our technical materials since more components can be shown and 2D plus, I don't say 3D, 2D plus reconstructions and measurements are possible. The first prototype, what you see here, uh, was 
also kind of hemispherical metallic type structure of 80 centimeters, it was about this, and 260 LED lights, and a, two, a 28 megapixel camera, and it was transportable. It was good for small and flat objects, but more problematic for bound books, manuscripts, and archival material. In the latest In the latest hardware, the dome has a rigid structure, and that was uh, the first image I saw, housing a sensor and a micro lens, and it is portable in a good rigid case. I can put it, uh, take it in the plane, with a quick setup and numerous mounting positions. The calibration is fast, and we use an electronic shutter camera. The micro drone became from 80, 30 centimeter, and the entire meter and has the same high resolution sensor as a fixed image area and the fixed image area we can model is about 12 to 18 centimeter. Labeling, quick and easy comparison. During development, and I go further to show you the here you see the microdome in the print room of the Royal Library of Belgium, here the mechano structure with the Bible of Anjou we could uh, adapt. Here from inside, an image from inside, uh, uh, we took, and the, one of the most important things is that it was movable, but we could move it in the conservation copy stand, developed by Manfred Meyer from the University of Graz, but also on a studio tripod, we could use it horizontally, um, horizontally, vertically, but also in all kinds of different uh, ways. A problem with the uh, microdome, or the first microdome, was that it was a full shape. The second uh, microdome was 30 centimeter large. We cut off a slide, so we really could monitor very deep into the gathering fold. So we really like features like ruling of uh, manuscripts, breaking of manuscripts, we could define and we could uh, 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 get. And this is a copy stand, you might know, there is in the uh, University, uh, in the Kitty Museum, there is also a copy stand from uh, my but we can mount up here the uh, microdome to uh, uh, visualize. And this is the final form like it is for the moment. So this is the uh, 3D print. We have 228 lights, LED lights in it. They are all connected to each other. We can take a slide out and we can put it like this inside. And here you see the engineers and uh, Manfred Meyer from France. Uh, doing the installation. So the book, the manuscript, is lying here, and this can, man can be manipulated up and down. But the copy stand can also be used, and you see the lights, just for normal digitizing of artifacts. The microdome hardware, just some technical information, the sensor is an Allianz Vision Procilla lens, 28 uh, megapixels. It's uh, in fact a video lens because we are taking so much, uh, uh, so much uh, uh, files, so much images that um, the, the, the wear and tear of the shutter would be a, a, a complex um, uh, issue. We have, after processing, taking the images, processing, there is a microdome viewer, and I will show it to you. Uh, later in my talk, it's a, a dynamic view, a viewer. It means once the files are taken, are processed, all scores can uh, have access uh, to the to the images and can use it for uh, exploring the surfaces of the uh, materials that are visualized. So this was quite uh, some technical information just to show you what can be uh, done with uh, visualizing book materials. And I have some um, examples which uh, I took the last uh, years, um, or the last uh, two years, just to show how observations of very minimal topographical um, uh, features 
can uh, give information. We go see with our naked eye, and as we have been book archaeologists looking very closely to know more information on all written sources, because that is very important, we really look at the documents, to uh, artifacts as a kind of uh, source. This is a very tiny little book uh, kept in one of our uh, libraries. It's a German little print, and you see here it's 15th century, made with wooden uh, boards. Um, and by manipulating, there is no any cover, and by man manipulating the lines with the mouse, you really work with the mouse through the, the different shading patterns, you can have very detailed information on how the book was produced, how the woodworker was using his tools. But like you see here, the strips of cutting where he had to add the positions of the Allentown binding area. We can, with our mouse, really evaluate over the surfaces. We can eliminate the cold. We only see shaded uh, feed features in different angles where some uh, small uh, impurities like wormholes come in clear. But also the structure, and here you have the sketch filter, so you really can um, make the topography with the structures in a kind of uh, drawing. We go into the inside of the book, so we have the same cover covered at the inside, and as we all know, books are laced in, so the element out rings coming in here and going out there again, and there's a little pin of wood showing it around. We go in back with our cursor, with our sensor, and adding new lights <coughs> to, our, uh, to our motors. And what we look here, here, you see these little curves, curls, that are visible, becoming more visible when you eliminate the color in your uh, um, uh, viewer. And in fact, these are little imprints from the chisel the woodworker is taking, the little curls making imprint in uh, the wood. Taking the filter, and then now we are going to another filter which is adapted in the microdome. You can eliminate the, uh, the texture and making a kind of drawing that makes, that makes clear how the composition, how the, how the woodworker did this book cover. If you go in, there's a zoom option, you really can zoom in completely into the object. So you're very close now. This is a detail of about four centimeters we are looking in now. So you really can see, going a little bit too quick, here, um, how the end bands are bound on three borders, the little curls of the shivel, here the little leather tip hooking in again. We only can look to the wood, but also we can look to the leather. And the leather covering is very important for book binding. And as you know, uh, looking to rubbings and studying book binding uh, has been a, a device done since uh, the 19th century. And I show you um, a cover from uh, a binding of uh, Plantin. Plantin was a, a master printer for Charles V in the beginning of the 16th century. And as you know, as being book workers or book binders or book conservators or object conservators, um, craftsmen worked very hard. They didn't have time to measure things. They worked with their hands and they worked with compasses. So what's clearly visible here, this is the cover of the book binding. This is the mark, uh, the printer's mark, uh, Labora in Constancia uh, from uh, Bautin, his uh, printer's mark. And if you're looking here, and I show you here these little icons here, these are the positions of the lights of the microdome who uh, are just activated the moment we are taking uh, this screenshot. We go in, we're taking away the color. We're going in this gray still, so now we really see the imprints. And what's interesting here is this line here. So there's a line of a compass 
drawn by uh, the book, uh, the book worker, and it is accentuated here with red, who really is shown, and you see, the binder is working so hard, he's not really completely in angle. So there's a few millimeters that is uh, changed. Here are the different filters you can apply, and finally also the sketch noses you can make. We call them digital robins because they are far more exact than, as we know, to working with uh, thin rice paper, with your crayon, or your wood, uh, 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 carbon wood uh, 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 board uh, piece uh, you take over. I show you another uh, example of uh, how uh, the visualization of uh, almost invisible features can be, can be made visible. This is uh, a manuscript from Nicolas Ruterius. He was from a bishop from Utrecht. And as you know, a lot of bindings in Europe has been destroyed in the uh, during the French revolutions. Armories were um, taken off, they were scratched off, they were cut out. Uh, we know all that during this French Revolution, a huge amount of material is lost or destroyed. So all, also the coat of arms of Nicolas Ruterius, who was in the center of this binding, were removed. But we clearly can make visible here the three vine leaves who were part of his armories and were destroyed. So the tool, the armor, the, 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 the hot uh, uh, pressure tool was taken so hard that we can see, can make it visible through the filters. Blind standard, Adam taught uh, bindings, as you all know, a lot of German bindings are made of Adam pig skin, are very difficult to read. So we have here, um, a representation of um, a book from the Reformation side with medallions from uh, Erasmus, who is uh, Martin Luther, and also from uh, Greek classical philosophers. For binding historians, it is an extremely difficult um, um, material to study because it's almost not visible with a normal light. And what you can see here, the little two little icons here, so the green, uh, green and the red are positioned zenithal, and you almost see nothing except some that there is tension and there is things to see. We are going with our cursor here on the left side, and you really see the shaded uh, 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 the shaded way of looking to the uh, device. The details, and here you see um, uh, a detail of the medallion of Hus. We can measure, and I can later on that, there is a measuring tool implemented, because we, before we take the image, we're doing a kind of calibration. So it means we, we put uh, a reference sheet with circles between the lens and the surface of the object, but makes it possible to calculate the dimensions on uh, four uh, numbers after the zero, so on 10 microns exact, how large an object we monitor to uh, is visible. The filters are taken away, so the color is taken away, it becomes clearly visible, and we make the digital uh, rubbing of the object. Another um, way of looking is here a very important uh, binding, uh, SPES binding, we call it, uh, SPES or HOPE uh, binding, who was produced in uh, Leuven by two binders, uh, Jacob Kandelaar and Johannes Barten. There exists in the world about 22 still surviving uh, examples, and here you see an image with a classical uh, rubbing like we know it since the 19th century and a lot used in uh, the 20th century. It depicts, it depicts a lady, uh, a, a, a woman on a circle in the, uh, on uh, the circle that is Fides, hope, and then here you have the, um, we'll say the, the logo, the monograph of uh, the binder. We can go in a very high detail 
to the characteristics, we can take out the light and make the monograms uh, clearly. This is almost invisible, but what's very important that is that the two binders were conflicting. And at the top moment, there were high religious um, discussions in Leuven, there were highly discuss a discussion between Catholics and Protestants, and so these very fine little monographs sign the difference or make the difference where and which binder had the market in production at that moment. Completely shaded filter. At the other side, the shading. And then the drawing component. This is a detail of the head in transmitted, but we also can measure so we can see here the forehead and the eye, the imprint of the eye is about 4, four millimeter. The dimensions of the text around the uh, imprint. And what's also quite interesting to see is how bookbinders, bookworkers progressed. So these plates, uh, casts, were imprinted with um, a press, a turning press. So between the leather, the book was placed under it, between the leather and they turned it. And there was always one part of the plate coming the first to the cast. So through the profiles we can make, with the measuring tool, so it's X and Z, we can look at the four dimensions, we can calculate in which way the plate or the tool touched the first, the letter, the soft letter. So as it's turned from right to left, it's always on the right corner, we see the imprint is, is, um, is clear. In this way, we make, we make a kind of genesis how uh, uh, an object or the book worker, the tooler, is developing his display in this context. So you see here the other corner where the uh, imprint, uh, the profile, is much deeper. Books, uh, we know, and especially very early books were very precious, were very remarkable, and we have some in, in codices, uh, like you all know, who have precious uh, ivory or uh, metal bindings. Most of them are lost, you know, also through power conflicts, uh, religious revolutions, especially the French Revolution again, was quite uh, destructive for everything of all materials that were added to uh, precious book manuscripts. And here you see one example of a very beautiful mosaic. Uh, so, um, uh, South Belgium, uh, uh, East Germany, with the depiction of the Virgin, St. Peter and St. Paul. Here also you have prophets around beautiful mountain crystals uh, bordered, and here in the corners the four evangelists. This object was brought to the conservation lab, to the book heritage lab, and we always take a kind of um, so it's synergy, taking the opportunity, doing research, monitoring, imaging, before and after uh, treatments to see how uh, kind of characteristics are changed. Here you see my colleague who is a metal conservator, uh, softly cleaning the details and adding all the kind of, uh, well, here you see a, bra a break, a, a serious break in the filigrane uh, borders. Now we're going to the bottom, so we have about a surface of 12 to 18 centimeters. It's a silver binding. We are looking with the different aspects. Making the drawing. And going more close so we can zoom in. Here you see again very clearly the two little cursors where the point is where we can take the image. It was very interesting, like you see here, a dirty finger coming clearly visible 
uh, at the left side. So we are going to the other side with a, with a lightning angle. So here we see the, the, the fingerprint, the thumb on the but also the corrosion, because these are little metal uh, pins in floral motifs, motifs uh, put around. We can measure, and you can see from this point to this point, it's 28 uh, millimeters and 9 millimeters deep. And again, more in zoom, the detail of the thumb, the dirty thumb, on the uh, silver metal. And here you have an elimination of all the colors where you see the imprint. Another manuscript who came, and it belongs to the church treasury of uh, uh, Tongeren, who is uh, uh, the oldest basilica uh, north of uh, the Rhine. Uh, so it was established in the 7th century. This is a, a codex, uh, an, a, a gospel book with a beautiful ivory carving uh, in the center. In fact, the ivory carving is probably earlier than the manuscript, so it was later, uh, laying, uh, later. It's flat, so I'm going again with beautiful uh, crystal bosses, cleaned here by the glass conservator. It's mounted in a velvet, which is much later, 16th century. Um, and now we are going to look very closely to the characteristics of this beautiful ivory and the way we can observe how the carving is done. So it's depicting a crucifixion with uh, the, the virgins around it and the resur resurrections of the souls here at the bottom. So the souls raising up and angels in the, uh, at the top crowning uh, the Christ. And the shaded moldus. In the drawing moldus we can see the images. And it's Conversed draw uh, sketch models. And now we are going closer in detail to the top. As you have seen, uh, I go a little bit further with more light, so I'm adding light to it. Uh, the heads are broken here. It's a very early damage already in the 19th century. In the most early lithographical representations, these heads already disappeared. And there's some small. Um, uh, adding with a kind of gypsum and this earlier 19th century restoration was added in here in. We're going to the shaded Buddhist. Here these earlier additions having another reflection so they are becoming more visible but also the texture of the ivory And here you see clearly how the carving is done around the arms of Christ. Here also you see the working tools and here you see little deformations, little um, flowers uh, uh, who were realized while we came through uh, in time. So this kind of earlier treatments became visible and could be removed. And here it again a detail of the carving, the tools in which the ivory was a very, very difficult uh, job uh, to do. It was a very delicate job because well, not one mistake was uh, uh, permitted. So to a very close observation of my, I show you now book material, but my colleagues in the archaeological department are also looking in this way to potteries, uh, to um, imprints of potteries, finger terms, uh, potteries, uh, how they are created to make a kind of identifications. So here again, with the measuring tool, 
we can make a profile line to every business we want to make, take the profile and we can export it to an Excel sheet to document our feature. And here even you see a, a, a crack and you can even see the little uh, well, profile, how deep the crack is and how long the crack is documented. By eliminating the light, this is becoming more visible. Embroidered bindings, textiles, is also very fascinating. We did tries with big tapestry, weaving, uh, very early, uh, damast, uh, velvet, all kinds of textures, but I'm showing you here an embroidered binding in which we took in the former Shakespeare Library in Washington uh, last uh, year, a 7th century embroidered binding where through the filters and the sketch filters you really can see the stitches of the silver thread uh, and the winding of the, of the uh, texture of the elements. I wanted to talk or to show you something very special. It's um, a devotional uh, um, cabinet. They are called enclosed gardens, but in fact they are paradise gardens. They are small retables who were made for the Augustinian nuns in the early 16th century. They are kept uh, in a museum in, in Mechelen until very recently they were about five centuries still in the context in the monasteries uh, with uh, the, well, only a few surviving um, uh, nuns. So they are made, and if you see this, uh, this is a, a case, there are devotional sculptures of female or male uh, saints. And around here there are more than 400 relics. It means relics, uh, remains of saints, mostly uh, referring to St. Ursula and the 11,000 virgins, pilgrims and seniors, and for the rest they are all flowers. And these flowers are artificial flowers made of parchment, silk, silk thread and metal threads. So they are made in the early 16th century for private devotions in the monastery. There are miniatures, manuscripts, and that is how I get uh, said, um, involved in this research project because they are a kind of uh, uh, prayer gardens uh, for the marriage of the nuns with their spiritual uh, Christ. Here you see miniatures, this is silver thread, these are pilgrimage incense, and these are flowers completely made out of parchment, and here this is parchment, this is uh, silk. We could go with the microdome, and here you see the, the microdome mounted uh, vertically, so we really could go into the garden when the glass was uh, removed. Here you see the fence with the entrance to the paradise gardens with the representations of the holy figures. This was very interesting because there were Anus Deis, Anus Deis, and there were um, representations of uh, the Lamp of Christ who were made from the candles uh, that were melted after Easter in the Vatican, in, in Rome. They were melted and so a kind of uh, healing seals were produced, taken by the pilgrimages, pilgrims to the uh, home site and they have a kind of a healing, uh, spiritual, uh, meditative, meditative, meditative uh, importance. They depicting here, and what you see here is an X-ray uh, image where you all you can see the metal connections of the silver thread and the metal threads, how they are casting really this Agnus Dei. And here you see with a microdome, with a uh, photometric stereo, we could relief, you see here the Christ raising from uh, his uh, tomb, an important crack that could be made visible. But at the bottom, we could make uh, the dating of the uh, insignia. It's uh, 1513. It was much earlier than the enclosed garden was made in 1530. 
These are the flowers, and you see these are lilies. There's definitely every uh, say flower, artificial flower, is a representation of botanical feature, lilies. Where we really put, and that was for the textile concept, which is very important, they could really see the structure of the parchment. These are metal threads, these are also wind metal threads, and then the silk who is weaving around. And with the measurements, we can exactly see before and after treatment because these enclosed plants are now conserved by a team of eight different disciplines of conservators and there's separately an art historical research on the meaning and the importance of these very spiritual little artifacts. We have been in uh, book bindings and now we are going to drawings. Drawings, and I have, I have an example of um, Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens, who was well, a master painter in uh, the 17th century, who was well, most known for his well, big, uh, very large uh, uh, paintings. Here you see one of his remaining sketchbooks. The most of them are burnt. He had four sketchbooks. Three are completely burnt in Versailles by accident in the late 18th century. But this is uh, remaining the Bordes Codex, it's called, uh, where you have uh, the sketches of the master. Here you see an, an, an ID, it's uh, on this side, and on this side is a measuring, and you see this is the side where the edge is, the folding edge where the binding is realized, while here you have the... the am I going to be? Yeah. Here. This is the outer side with loose, so you really can see through the measuring how the coupling in this edge fold is more prominent and is about 6,6 uh, deviations. So it's really a very uh, great uh, coupling. So we are taking one uh, folio in scope where rough sketches of Hercules uh, uh, made in pen and in graphite by uh, the artist. Here you see the remains of well, the, the glue. Um, when you eliminate the, the drawing, you see the texture of the paper, and what becomes visible is that the paper has been folded in four before the binding was uh, realized, so in the sketch modus. Here you see again the fold side, where we measured before being 6.6 .6 millimeters in width, but also the watermark, the filigrane, eh, the watermark becoming visible. And as you know, in paper protection, you have uh, the screen paper pulp is put on. It's the metal thread was woven by the paper maker uh, in the screen. On the point where the, the metal thread is added, the paper pulp is less thick, is thinner. So we can visualize the thickness of the paper and be clear uh, where the lines uh, are visible and here in between the metal thread depicting the mark, watermark. Even here, and this is a tear, later repaired with a little patch of paper. This is a sketch, sketch modus, we can make it visible. We are going more in detail really to the area uh, where the watermark is and it's, you have one, two, three, four change stitches without eliminating the color. With eliminating the color, we can measure exactly the distance between the two chain lines. can make the distance, but we also can measure here where the points, where the paper becoming thinner, where the metal thread is uh, added. And again, the true image. 
We go from very small paper uh, scale to very, very large. This is a cartoon from Peter Koeken van Aalst, who was um, a very famous painter, but uh, also he made cartoons, uh, set models for tapestry weaving in Brussels, who uh, was uh, quite a very important production center and who has export to all Europe. Uh, uh, lots of them are for the moment in the metropolitan here uh, in the United States. This is a cartoon, and as you see the mansion, it's almost four meter large until three meter twenty high. And this is uh, this is the cartoon, so it's it's drawn on paper. This is the tapestry, who is not in the museum in Brussels, but in another museum, woven after it. The cartoon is very important because it was a kind of master item. It was cut in bias, so in 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 strips and was used by the weaver, weavers laid under the loom and they would weave using this model. We know that more than six tapestries at least are still surviving made on this cartoon. In the 19th century they lost of course their uh, uh, say importance as weaving was done in another way, and this kind of tapestry or, uh, or weaving was not existing anymore. But the a collector, Caro, he uh, bought the uh, cartoon, he assembled it on canvas, and he depicted it as a uh, painting. Here you see the microdome, so we are going onto the scaffoldings with uh, the microdome, uh, taking sampling, uh, doing sampling here. We are taking a detail, and we know that there are transfer techniques. So there is a model, and the model is transferred by the weavers or by, by the owners uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the cartoon to make uh, copies. So a very, very nice detail of a head of one of the lady. The team is the beheading of uh, 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 Paul. It's a very quite dramatic, but also through looking and examining it with the microdome we could clearly see the prickings, so the transfer of the weight, so little bounces by, made, made by a very thin uh, uh, metal point to transfer the drawing onto the copy. And this is a detail of the uh, bounces that could be made visible. For scholars in well, tapestry and drawing is a very important source of information. On the other hand, this is in conservation treatment uh, with the French keep from the Louvre. All these kind of features like cracks, lacunas, were very important documentation because they, well, sometimes they remained, sometimes they were flattened. As we know, that this cartoon uh, was really intensively used in the uh, rooms in the uh, factories of the tapestries. And, well, a last example for uh, paper uh, and drawings and the possibilities to examine them with a photometric stereo, but we always go to kind of interactive approach and trying to uh, collaborate with laboratories uh, to see what we can reveal. This is Justicia for Peter Bruegel the Elder, uh, one of uh, the artists uh, who has a kind of virtuous uh, skills of drawing and putting on a quite uh, small scale. Um, here you see a drawing in pen on ink. Uh, we examined through XRF uh, the composition of the different kinds of the different types of uh, inks used by Peter Bruegel. He made these drawings as a kind of models for uh, prints that would be produced by Koch, uh, uh, an editor, uh, closely later. And we go into a detail in the right uh, side, it's a justicia, it's horrible image in fact, about all kinds of tortures and, 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 and punishments made um, in uh, the 16th uh, century. So you see here the, I don't know the word in English, the, the where they hang people uh, up. The gallons, yes. Uh, the gallons are here, and it's really a big crowd coming to see. But here you see a man uh, hanging up uh, by his legs and arms, three, uh, three men looking, 
is some more torture going on. And what is working or what we are fascinated with is in fact that how did Peter Bruegel, who was an extremely good draftsman, how could he realize these drawings? Because everything is in place, everything is put uh, where it has to be. And so through looking again very, very detailed to the images with uh, the, uh, the device and with the, with the spectrum, and that's something I mentioned in the beginning, we uh, uh, created uh, last year, in 2015, uh, a multispectral uh, lens. We added in a second uh, device with infrared, uh, UV, and white, uh, green, blue, and uh, uh, red lights. We can image the different types of inks. So we can look to the genesis. How did Peter Bruegel create in very small, detailed, details his uh, drawings. From data you go into parchment and manuscript. So we are going a little bit back in time, but just to show you uh, how all the marvels we know and the details, how manuscripts and illuminations, all tooling and um, uh, <coughs> it's very prominent. So this is the sizzling. I show you. And I want to finish, in fact, um, by showing you, because we worked until now with, with um, um, screenshots, what I'm trying to do now is look, show you how in a uh, wheel the The viewer is working, so I'm here in the program. I'm loading a digitized object. I'm going to Tongeren and I'm going to have uh, cover one. So now I'm opening a file. It takes a while because it's all get quite heavy. And here I am in the viewer. So we have, we have seen this image before because it's a beautiful ivory. Uh, so when I do to this, I'm in Zenith light. I can make here more or less light. And here I can go with my cursor around. I'm just going to turn, going a little bit. Shaded, so now the colors are made. So, in fact, I have 228, multiple 228 possibilities to um, uh, to perform, to have different angles, and I'm just looking what's interesting for me, being a researcher, and then I can go to the sketch modus. So it's just to finish to say it's a way of um, monitoring in very high detail the topographical characteristics of um, artifacts. Um, it's quite quick. It takes four minutes to take the image. It takes 20 minutes to process. And after the processing, you can have access, say, to true view. You can manipulate it. There is an online viewer um, that is, um, well, you can download it, and if you have the files, the Zoom files, you can go and you can explore, everybody who wants, uh, the characteristics of the features. 
it's a prototype. We are working on it. We are working with our engineers and, um, and our photographers to implement it more. We are working on 3D objects. We are working on manuscripts. We will work on drawings on several mediums. And we hope with collaborations with other institutions to get this tool um, so it really uh, has, is implemented in, in art historical uh, research projects but also in conservation labs because it really can reveal what the human eye or the naked eye with true light can uh, not see. So uh, thank you for your attention and I hope uh, you get fascinated by all the details that can be explored through looking very closely and of course making an interpretation you need a scholarly eye, you need background information to make the interpretation, but that's very important. Thank you. Yes, so it's, it's not to, uh, on, uh, for sale, but uh, uh, we have been traveling um, in Europe, but also in the United States. Uh, we can take it in the Samsonite uh, in the unit, uh, um, and, and we might produce some more prototypes for, uh, uh, for uh, institutions we are collaborating with. We, it's, a, it's a prototype. It means the software is permanently in evolution, so we have every year three, four updates uh, for it, but we are uh, confident that in a few years this uh, uh, the microdome with the software, because there are other microdomes in other museums, and LTI is, 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 a, is, a, is a, well, something that is known, but it's, uh, the special, well, the special um, characteristics, it's really the software that is developed to look very closely to, uh, to, to objects. Yes? Yeah, um, a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Let me say that to begin with. But um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the software and what the kind of um, you know, parameters for processing, how, they, how the different you know, sort of filters and features. Uh, you said, uh, if I understand you, it's one image. And after you have that image, the viewer software is doing the processing the information according to various kinds of filters and features. So who developed that and, and what are the what, what's the what are the prototypes for that? And yeah. Well, um, well my, my colleague uh, from the ASAT is unfortunately not, not with uh, with me, but in fact uh, ASAT to the the electro engineers, they are um, very active in G D imaging, especially in medicine. So that's the um, uh, the department in, in Leuven, who has a very strong, but also in archaeology, so they are working on the 3D um, um, reconstruction of the catacombs in Rome, like this. But that's why they are also working on auto, auto, automatic cars and visualization. And so they have, for them, cultural heritage is not really the big, uh, uh, said, um, part of their research, but they really love it. They were really fascinated by it. And in the beginning, I, I remember four years ago, the first time, I, was, I had to explain what a manuscript was. They had never, the, the team, the engineers had a manuscript made by, 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 by hand, so I really had to explain. But they got very fascinated because you, you start to, to tell them and, 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 and talk to them, and, and they really got completely fascinated. So they are this quite now a team also from young PhD students who are going to develop and to work with in our team because we, we are trying what we want him to do is like shape recognition so that we can recognize like imprints and stamps that we really, when we have an image, we can recognize it in, in different patterns and things like that. So, um, um, the point is, yes? What I, what I was going to say is I think um, obviously we've never used your you know your setup in particular, but I know that there's a um, reflectance transformation imaging. There's a group in California, Cultural Heritage Imaging, that um, has come down and taught a workshop, yeah. for example, for the UCLA Getty students. And and I know that actually 
it, it's, it's a vast number of images that are captured. Um, it, can, it can be like hundreds of images, actually, that are captured, that are then put into, and each one of them, you're, you're actually, you're changing that, you're, you're moving around that, that angle of lighting in a very, very specific sort of modular way, moving around, collecting all of those imaging and all of those images and then that processing that you're talking about, the software, is what allows you to change that angle of illumination um, yeah. you know, on your screen. So yes, that's, that's, that's yeah. true. That and in true? fact, it's, yes, and yeah. in fact, uh, yeah. reflection transformation imaging is invented in, in here in California through okay. Hugo yeah. Hugo Packard. Or, um, yeah. Already in the 90s, I yeah. think in the middle of the 90s, but at the same time, when it was invented, the group in Northern started, and the soft the software developments is different. So the, because they they did it uh, yeah. in in two different ways. And so that's why we are going more to that photometric stereo because it has more possibilities for the measuring and the comparing. And as we know, if you can measure something, you can know what you do and what you see. And that's a, a very important um, uh, challenge for, for the, the aims, what we want to do. We are in contact with the group here in, in, the, in California. We met also. And so it's of course we are, well, it's, it's a creative thing. They are also working, they have given very good workshops, in fact, and courses, and they are very active. Yes. That's great. Yes. So I have a question. It's fascinating as research tool, but of the ones you get, these are, say, 500 or 600 years old. Is there one? One that reflects the truth, that is, let's say you're doing an exhibit, a demonstration, and why do we have this old book? You know, the public is seeing it. And is it because it's been worn and old, and your technology simply shows the way it originally was, or are they showing up things that they wouldn't see otherwise? So it's a kind of a cosmic question of what is the truth? Could you use this to show, well, wow, this was so much more beautiful than it was originally done, or is that not really true? Yes, um, well, um, I don't know, it, it don't show really how it has been originally done, it shows how it's, it's done. And I think of course for public um, display it can be, it can be used, we didn't do it until now, we have some projects coming up where they really want to use it in exhibits, in, 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 in a kind of display, even with, with touch screens you, you, can, you can zoom in. It's, it's, what is, I, I always say it's a third knowledge platform. You cannot see it, it's there, you cannot see it with your naked eye. You see more, you see more, and you can, you can make more interpretations. Um, I think for the broad public, when you show them these images, everybody say, wow, I never saw them so close or so in such a textures um, in, in that way. So perhaps for, for, for younger generations, they might be very, very challenged to do, uh, to, to, to use it. And, 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 and to work, uh, to work on it. It's not showing the original. It's showing. It's show, in fact, it's showing the decay. It's, it's showing also the damage and the flaws and the and the imperfectness. But that's a part. That's a part of it because you know when you look into a beautiful exhibition catalog, the images are perfect and the lights and the colors are perfect. But it's it's not always how the objects are. And especially as professionals, we are uh, working on cultural heritage. We have to see the truth. We know we, we are interested in how the case is going on and we want to stop it and we want to, want to work around it. And for as documentation, it's a very important uh, tool. Yes? Have you used this in balances as at all? To try to see under no. Um, we, uh, what's very interesting, not in balances, uh, we see, of course, the erasure. We see when. Um, yeah. We are doing uh, trials with the, the new mode spectral uh, microdome uh, uh, to, to, to see the things. But what I found very interesting, uh, and it's not, it's not an, an issue I brought up today, is by uh, you can really see how the scribe is writing and the thickness of the ink layer. So he's putting his quill in the ink and he's writing, and the inner ink is becoming thinner. And then after six letters, he's putting the quill again. And you really can measure the thickness of the ink layers and see the sequences described as well. So for paleographers and people studying how, how well, the creation of a, of a certain text, it really can give um, extra information 
but the gold spectrum you can see the different kind of things uh, like uh, when is this, is this the next day for example is the, the ink more dense so on this kind of it has also very very interesting possibilities Very interesting idea, um, and it's something of us very poetic about yeah. microtone. We put insects under them, like yeah. butterflies. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing what you see in the wings of butterflies. Feathers. 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 <laughs> so there, there are still a lot of possibilities we didn't explore, but it's really the shells. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so modern pearl. It's, it's, it's like well, it's, there's a lot to do, and of course, we hope that there are lots of young scholars getting fascinated by the micro. In fact, it's not so difficult to use. After training uh, of, a, of a few hours, you can you can use it, and uh, so we hope that also in, in, in PhDs and master theses that the tool can become uh, rather a kind of uh, implementation. Um, it's a very interesting question, and of course, it's it's an evolution that's that's going to to become more prominent in coming years because imaging, and that's the last thing about imaging, it's non-invasive. You can get so much information without sampling, without uh, it's quick, uh, more or less quick. It's more quicker than chemical analysis and things like that. So I think as a conservation uh, scholar, student, you have to be aware of all these uh, imaging techniques. You have to, you, you need to talk to, to, to professionals, really the ones who are doing it, and you have to get in communication with them and be very performant in what you want to know about the object or the book or the thing you are treating. On the other hand, I think if you're uh, focused on one thing, that you could become, in fact, do it, doing it yourself, but then if you have very typical research or a PhD or something that you say, okay, I can do it because if you don't have to rely all the times to somebody else a second, and one, one thing is very important, the handling. What you saw, but this, these are all extremely fragile objects. So I'm a conservator and I'm, I'm, I'm also doing the research, but I'm there and manipulate the objects. The photographers, they are great and you can train them, but they never get this, the sensibility. So that's something you have to work, you can train them of course also to say how to manipulate a, 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 a manuscript with all folios that are, you can train them, you can learn them things, but you have a responsibility as a conservator in, in the big game or the big target of revealing information from, from uh, objects. So if you are talented and you are challenged, do it yourself, but not, I would say, uh, uh, look for very good partnerships. And the other side, I feel also that uh, the imaging technolo well, technologies, they, they take the images, but they don't know what they see. It's the art historian or the conservator who says that's what that is what's happening under your we can make that interpretation. But, so it's a very collaborative and it's like with the chemists. We have to work with people who digitize and and, 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 um, and do the doing the images. And it can be a very strong uh, bond and, and, a, and a target. Yeah. Conversation outside, but let's give Leva.